Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Good. You're looking very lovely. I love that necklace. It's beautiful. Oh, thank you very much. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so the way this works, I'm going to ask you to tell us your name and share anything you feel comfortable sharing about yourself with us so we can get to know you a little bit better. So I'll start. Please tell us your name. Yeah, so my name is Soraya Campbell. I uh, work for Duke University. I'm assistant director in the Global Education Office for undergraduates. I've been at Duke for about seven years, and I've been working in international education in general for about 17 years. Mm -hmm. I used to work at the University of Florida. That's where I got my degrees, um, bachelor's and master's. And then after that, I went to the College of Charleston mm -hmm. in Charleston, South Carolina, a very lovely place. And I worked there for about five years or so. Um, and then I came, eventually came here to Duke and Durham. So I'm very glad to be part of um, the Durham community, the Duke community. Um, you know, Duke is a very interesting um, place to work for. Um, you know, I've learned a lot here. So um, other than that, in general, I, you know, I'm married, I have a family, I have two young children. And, you know, I love to read, I love to bake, I love to run, and I love just being part of um, the Durham community here. So Wonderful. Very, very mm -hmm. wonderful. What brought you from Florida to North Carolina? What, oh, I should say Charleston then to North Carolina. How did you, how did you decide this is where you were going to be? Yeah, so good questions. <laughs> Everybody makes fun of me because I keep moving north, but I, I feel like this is the furthest north that I will... Uh, you know, venture to. I'm actually, um, I'm sort of half from New York City and half from Miami, mm -hmm. but I really call Miami my hometown. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of used to, the, you know, the South and, and uh, the weather and all that. So getting used to colder climates is a little bit um, different for me. But anyways, um, back to your question is that from University of Florida, actually, um, it, it was my husband's career that brought us to Charleston, South Carolina. And I just so happened to uh, hook up or hook into College of Charleston mm -hmm. uh, as far as doing the same work that I was doing in University of Florida through um, academic circles. Mm -hmm. So that was very, uh, you know, fortuitous or, or advantageous and, and lucky for me. And so I was there for about five years. And then, uh, you know, I grew and grew in my position and I felt like I wanted something more. Mm -hmm. So then after that, I applied to the position here at Duke and um, got it, you know, got the position and moved up here to Durham. Excellent. Did your husband come with you too? So he's there in Durham? He did. Too? Yes, yes, he, he did. He was able yeah. to find a position too? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. Let me ask yeah. you a question. How do you identify? Uh, you, uh, you consider yourself a brown person? How, how do you identify? Yeah, so another good question. Um, I, I identify as a person of color in general. I'm actually very um, of mixed background. Mm -hmm. And, you know, growing up in the U.S., so I, I was born here in the U.S. My parents are not from the U.S. My mom's from Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. um, and then my dad's from Trinidad. Okay. And so I'm, if you technically want to talk about it, I'm half Hispanic. Um, but even so, my mother um, is very mixed, you know, and Dominican Republic has a large mixture of different types of people from all over the place. And, and my father, you know, being from Trinidad, he's primarily of Indian, East Indian descent. So, um, but, you know, growing up, I, it was funny because I've grown up in places that were minority majority mm -hmm. I never really had to think about my ethnicity mm -hmm. per se I mean I always w was around people that somewhat look like me mm -hmm. nobody really even asked me you know <laughs> what are you you know like where are you from or anything like that I mean I um, you know always just thought of myself as American per se and um, it, it was only until I went to college at University of Florida in Gainesville where I wasn't in a minority majority place anymore 
that people started asking me these questions and it, it really, you know, it really made me think because you know, especially growing up in the U.S., you know, my fam even though I was very close to both of my family's sides in Dominican Republic and in Trinidad, and we used to go visit there all the time, they didn't, uh, we were always considered American mm -hmm. because of the way we talked and just our sensibilities. Mm -hmm. So they called us Yankee and like all this stuff, you know, so um, when people started asking me, like, where are you from? I'm like, well, I'm American. And it was like, well, no, where are you really from? I'm like, I'm American, <laughs> you know, I share your culture and everything. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was a very interesting um, dynamic and, and way of thinking about these things. It, it really kind of threw me for a loop when I got a little bit older. So identifying as a person of color, what does that mean to you exactly? So, you know, for, for some black and brown people, it's considered more of a, I would say a descriptor, a negative descriptor to be a person of color, you know? So we've seen these police shootings and killings and all of these things of black men. There've been a few brown men, but mostly predominantly black men and women. Um, what, when, you, when you think about that in this part of America, North Carolina, does it have any effect on you or does it make you question uh, how we see race and ethnicity? So, I, I mean, it's complicated, yes. I mean, I, out of anything, I identify more with, so I identify more with the struggles that people of color have in this, uh, in this country. It's a little bit different from me, especially coming from a family who's first generation, I'm, I'm first generation, my family's not from here. I, I don't identify as much or, or, you know, I'm completely obviously in solidarity, but, uh, you know, the struggles of black Americans here in the US, I feel like they have such a different, obviously cultural heritage and um, they have a lot more struggles and baggage and, and things that they have to deal with than somebody like me. I am a person of color, but I'm not a person who's African-American, you know, who's, you know, whose family has, um, you know, for generations been uh, either enslaved or um, has experienced, you know, deep-seated uh, systemic racism. And I know, for example, with a lot of the unrest that has been happening here a lot of people have been examining just the history of systemic racism in the U.S. and I think um, there was a uh, his his Netflix show actually just got canceled I think Hassan Minaj who's actually um, he, he does the Patriot Report or, or uh, some kind of show um, on Netflix mm -hmm. he is of um, I think Pakistani descent and he actually really called out a lot of communities of color, people of color that have come to the U.S. somewhat recently, like in the 60s and 70s and so on, and called them out and saying, like, you know, a lot of the reason that you have the freedoms and liberties and, and don't experience the overt racism that people experience in the past is in direct consequence of the struggles and, you know, trials and travails of black Americans in this country you know so in that sense you know I feel in solidarity with the black community black Americans when it comes to being a person of color but I fully realize that you know their struggle is was so much different from mine and and also me being here is a direct result from you know all the 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 blood, sweat, and tears, literally, of what they've done in this country for many generations. That's an amazing awareness. I talk to people about that all, all the time, you know, um, after Reconstruction and Jim Crow, it was the black man that got the vote first, <coughs> uh, and then white women, and then women in general, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, much of the gains in the civil rights space has been made on the backs of black people. So people like yourselves, you know, you know, I, I won't say Mexican Americans because I think they had their own struggles uh, apart from us. Indigenous people had their own struggle apart from us. But the gains that you can look at and say, you know, 
you know, I'm a woman, I'm free to speak my mind, to go where I want to go, wear my hair however I want to wear my hair, do whatever it is, is because of how much black blood was shed. You know, and one of the things that I am, I struggle with is the term African American or black, right? So mm -hmm. when we first came out of uh, um, uh, slavery, we, the N word, the real N word was used a lot. Then we became Negroes, then we became uh, Afro Americans, and then eventually African Americans. And now, you know, there are these these, these colorful terms like persons of color, you know, and, and what's the politically correct thing. And uh, I can tell you for myself, and I only speak for myself, I am a black woman. I don't identify as African-American. I don't identify as, as anything. So my, my mother's, no, I'm sorry. My father's father is white. My mother's mother's mother is white. And there's Native American in my family. So, you know, I have all of that in my, my, my gene pool. And yet, and still, the only place I feel safe is being Black. You know, I mean, like, I, I can identify with mixed race kids. I can identify with, with people from different backgrounds. But the place I feel safest is the place I'm most vulnerable as a Black woman, right? Because I'm angry. You know, they've all these stereotypes they've laid upon me as this. And so when I look at you, you're a beautiful woman, intelligent, you know, you know, have made some significant accomplishments. You know, I would say your struggle was much easier than mine. I will be 62 in November. And uh, this recent position is the first time I've had a title other than a director of IT with more than 40 years of experience and, you know, doctorate degree and all of that. And I'm not I, I'm invisible, voiceless, valueless, worthless, you know, all of those things. Yeah. And there are all these other things that they attach to me. I'm sure they don't attach to you, right? So black people are considered promiscuous, you know, right? We have sex everywhere. We just lay down and make babies. We're all on welfare. You know, there are all of these stereotypes that, that exist out there about being black, simply black, not brown, not whatever. You know, the Hispanic community has their, their, their stereotypes. But you know, there's this bright line, and I did not know this until I started doing these chats, the difference between Hispanic and Latino, you know, because I just thought it was just interchanging the words, but it is really a different, a bright line difference between being Hispanic and being Latino. And a lot of Latinos identify with Spain or Cuba or somewhere else, but not, not you know, countries to the south of us like Mexico and you know, Philippines and all those kind of places like that, you know, so it's that kind of thought about that. So I want to ask you, uh, sorry, just soapbox, I just wanted to get my, my piece out there about yeah, it. Yeah. I really, I really appreciate your awareness of that because that's really, really important. Um, mm -hmm. There was a young girl um, that she had to sign up. Um, she was from Palestine and she had to sign up and she said, uh, I know how I have my rights is because you have yours. And that to me was really, really you know, one of those salient points that just hit me so close to my heart, I didn't even understand it. And so she's in a country, a war-torn country, a country that's always, you know, on the on the fringes of battle. And she held up this sign, you know, and I don't know what rights, she's a little girl, you know, she might be six, seven years old, held up this sign that says, I have rights because of Black Americans. And that was really, you know, it was deep. It was really deep for me. And so yeah. what, what I want to ask you now, so as you have identified yourself, have you had difficulty advancing in your career, being accepted in your school, being welcomed into uh, the predominantly white community. Did you experience any of that? So, yes, I have. Um, but again, I feel like I've had a somewhat divergent experience. And I don't know. So again, I'm only speaking for myself. I mean, I can't speak for, I mean, since, especially since I'm ethnic ethnically mixed, you know, quote unquote. Um, I'm not sure how other, for example, Hispanic people have had it um, or other people who are from the Caribbean um, have had it. But, you know, I've always occupied spaces where I'm basically the only person of color. Period. Absolutely. Yep. You know, at first, especially uh, as I mentioned, I've come from a place that's uh, minority majority. Mm -hmm. When I first experienced it, it was very shocking. Not, I mean, I wouldn't say, I guess not shock. It's a shock to the system. It wasn't mm -hmm. shocking mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that, you know, I, I would 
speak things and I would, you know, operate how I normally do. And people didn't respond to me in the way that, you know, my normal crew of people would right. respond to me. It was right. a very like, hmm, you know, like it, just, just different. And I quickly realized, and, you know, I'm sure that you're very well of this. I mean, of the whole thing of um, somewhat code switching or just changing basically the way you operate within different spaces. Yep. And I became a quick student of that, you know, just almost immediately because I knew that I wanted to, for example, when I was in school, I actually st studied uh, ancient Greek and Latin. Not a lot of people of color do that. I was one of the only people of color who was in there. It was a complete just, it was difficult, yeah. I, I would say. And the, even the perspectives that were shared um, in the classroom and from t the, the professors wasn't very, I would say, amenable or open to perspectives of people of color I mean like I, I just didn't hear any like scholarship from people of color I mean not saying that it, there, there wasn't you know but I just it wasn't you know highlighted to me or wasn't really you know spoken of as much in in my sphere and you know even just the way I talked I mean I I, I still have it today and even like you know my husband mentions it to me for me to be conscious of it but you know there's a certain way of talking in Miami you know that's a different accent it's very colored by you know Spanish and just you know slang and, and all that I had to just get rid of that cut it out you know just and but you know especially when I start talking to people and I get more comfortable it kind of comes out mm -hmm. uh, but I, I really try to push that down really mm -hmm. because I feel that when people hear that from me they're not their estimation but just I, I feel like they don't see me as much as a professional anymore or you know an authority in in what I'm saying mm -hmm. so I've really had to temper myself and my truth which is kind of sad I mean like but mm -hmm. I think as people of color just in general you know no matter what culture you're coming from you, you have to um, let me not say you have to, but it's easier to adapt to the to the main culture and to the main um, you know the dominant culture in order to thrive professionally. So, so let me ask you this: I'm going to go back to your mother and father. So your mother is from Dominican Republic, and does she speak English or does she speak uh, Spanish? She speaks Sp Spanish. She speaks English too. Um, Spanish is her dominant language, though. And, and your um, father? My father speaks English. Okay. So, when you were talking about code switching, and I'm going to tell you why I asked you that in a minute. But when you talk about code switching. So, in the, in the black home, in the average black home, and I'm and I'm more speaking of my own, but in the average black home, we call code switching the way we communicate, right? So, um, for example. Um, I may yell downstairs and say to my husband, hey, do we have any more um, detergent? And he may say, we ain't got none. <laughs> you know, and he's doing that lightheartedly. But you mm -hmm. don't have to be on your P's and Q's, you know. And so there's a part in the Black community where if you speak properly, in other words, when you say the word the, you put your tongue between your teeth to say the as opposed to duh. You know, that's called talking white. And so then on the other side, while you're in your home with your family, you're talking all those things, talking white, talking, you know, like normal black people, you know, all this, you, you get that lazy tongue, if you will. So mm -hmm. when I, I lived in Miami uh, during the Mariel boat lift, when they first started bringing Cubans in into Miami in the mid eighties. And I remember there was such a push because the dominant number of Cubans that were coming onto the, the shores of Miami, there was thing, a referendum in that in an election that year about whether they would make Spanish the predominant language in in Florida. And of course, you know how big Florida is. So you got, you know, Cubans don't make up all of Florida. They make up more of the southern part, Miami, you know, a little bit in the Key West, a little bit up north, Fort Lauderdale, but but not like say St. Augustine or some of these Tampa, some of these other places. They're not that 
prevalent there. And so this thing became a really, really big thing, right? And so I had gone to a talk uh, about this, about whether they were going to make Spanish new language. And a lot of white Americans found that offensive that we would even consider that, considering that America was, our, our traditional language was English. And so I'm sure you have heard in the news reports where Hispanic and Latino people are speaking their native tongue and they're being told, speak, speak English, you know, speak oh, yeah. English. And so when I asked you about your mother, you know, my question is, is like, so when she's in her native country, she speaks her native language. Mm -hmm. But when she comes here to visit you in America or, or whatever, she speaks English. I'm assuming that's correct. Is that right? Well, she lives in Miami with my dad. So, I mean, okay. yeah. And then you, having lived in Miami, you know that I, I think it's the majority of people speak Spanish. Yep. And more people speak Spanish than English, honestly. Yep. I feel, uh, well, let me take that back. I think the last time I checked the stats, I think 70 percent of people spoke Spanish but like there's a mix in there that I mean obviously that they speak both English and Spanish and then I think only about 20 or 30 percent only speak Spanish so mm -hmm. I did a minor in, in, in uh, Spanish and I got I got two and a half degrees in two and a half years when I first went back to college I didn't go back to college until I was in my 40s uh, and Spanish was one of those languages yeah. and what I have learned so I, I didn't keep up my skills so when when Spanish people talk, I can almost understand everything that they're saying. I can't say, I can't communicate with them because I, I don't, like, I don't even know how to roll my R's like that, but you know, that, that, that language. And it's, it's such a diverse language because there are so many versions of Spanish speaking. So, mm -hmm. you know, Mexicans speak one version, Cubans speak another version, you know, and you go all over the, the planet and there's a de different version. Some words are, are, are the same across languages, so computadora, you know, like computers, you know, like, so yeah, for example, word like that doesn't, mm -hmm. doesn't change, whatever. But if you take such things as going to the bathroom or water or something like that, it has different meanings in different, different cultures. So having a mother and a father from not native to America, did they feel, or do you know if they felt like they had to adjust their code switching, if you will, to become a part of this society productively? I mean, yes, they, I, I do. Um, and then, you know, in, in this sense, I, especially being older now, I really have to give a lot of credit to my parents because I think about it from their perspective and their ages coming to a new country especially the time that they did. So my parents came over in the 70s or so. My mom was about 15 or 16 and my dad was a little bit older and just having to, and then, you know, with my mom, the language barrier um, in and of itself, my dad, you know, knew English obviously, but he spoke differently. He had a really thick Caribbean accent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the difficulties that they had in trying to assimilate and acclimate to the culture and country, I just, you know, I, I, I always just think, oh my God, like they, you know, they did this for us, you know, because I mean, they literally did, they came to another country to make a better life for themselves. Absolutely. And it was very difficult. And just to this day, I just, you know, I can't, I can't even imagine I like me right now just picking up and moving somewhere to a different country and and trying to you know start something for my children you know yeah. but you know the, where they moved to though they were in New York City um you know there were my mom was yeah my mom was in Spanish Harlem you know with all the other Dominican people you know my dad was you know in different places he was in Brooklyn and Bronx and like you know he had his Caribbean community mm -hmm. as well but I remember you know for example my dad would tell me stories and the way he talks about this is so interesting because it was just a given I mean like he just didn't even think about it like how we would think about this today but for example he would tell me how he would go to Manhattan to downtown to try to look for jobs and people would tell him point blank in his face, oh, we don't hire Jamaicans, go over to so-and-so place, they hire Jamaicans. And you know, lo and behold, he's not Jamaican, but like, because he has a Caribbean accent, like, right. you know, they just lump them all and together. 
right yeah. exactly and like he was just like okay you know <laughs> he just went to like whatever there was so and so and then like oh do you hire you know people from the crew and yeah okay then here you go but just think about that today i mean if somebody told you that today is shocking and and just horrible you know you would never say that or hopefully ever do that in general i would not um, say it would be horrible and, and, uh, and accept it i say people hear that all the time all the time yeah yeah yeah, so. yeah. but i mean so just even thinking about my dad this so this is another funny tidbit about my parents so growing up with them i never thought they had an accent i just never did because it was just what i was used to mm -hmm. and uh, when i started when i was in school and especially when i you know went to college and my friends would meet my parents are like, oh, like your dad has a really thick accent. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? <laughs> and sometimes they didn't understand him. And I was like, how do you not understand my dad? My dad speaks, you know, normal <laughs> and all that. And it was only until later that I kind of thought, okay, but you know, my dad really, you know, since he moved here, he's, you know, uh, toned down on his accent obviously like living in the u.s for such a long time um but whenever he's with his trinidadian friends or when we go back to trinidad then he goes back into that mode of talking just like a trinidadian and you know some of the patois that they have and and like you know then sometimes i can't even understand him yeah. <laughs> well i will say you are standing on their shoulders and you should be eternally grateful because it was the sacrifices that they made to come here and endure what they endured so you could be who you are today and have the success you have today. So you are absolutely standing on their shoulders. So, you know, yeah. I, and I always say that, you know, we don't realize how much those who came before us gave for us to be here, right? You know, so one of the things that right now we're, we're in this pandemic and we're also in the middle of a, an election uh, term, you know, and, uh, you know, I always say to my children, you, I don't care if they're running for the, town trash can man you have to vote because someone died so you could vote and i'm not just mean one or two people but lots of people died so you can vote so you don't have a choice to not vote and this is me as a black mother talking to my black children you have to vote you, i don't care what it is if they whatever the election is you get up and you go down there and vote and yes. so you know understanding the trauma and the trials and tribulations of those that came before us regardless of where they came from right so you know, Trinidad, Jamaica, wherever, Haiti, Haiti is one of my favorites because like, I mean, Haiti is the only country that has defeated America, the only country that has defeated America. And so Haitian people who come here, especially those who were not born here, maybe they have a Haitian mother and father, but they were not born here or whatever the case may be. They are on the outside looking in still to this day because of the fact that they are the only only country in all the countries in the world that has defeated America. So Haitians really catch it on both ends, right? So, you know, yeah. They, yeah. And, and so, and then when you, when you kind of think about this, and you know, I'm, 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 we're going to move away from this. I want to hear about your career, but, 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 you know, when you think about this, you know, so when your children are your age or, you know, going away to college or whatever it is, they're going to tell the same story you just told. You know, yeah. my mom and dad did these things and they they encountered struggles, but they overcame. And I can say, you know, I am successful because of what my parents gave me. And that's what we all hope for, is to give our children the best possible future and outcome that we can, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why economics and wealth is such a big deal in the black and brown communities, because, you know, there's so many times where you see, like, like so last thing I'll say about that. So you saw a couple, three, Maybe, maybe it's been long, maybe it's been a year now, I don't know exactly, but when uh, the person that is in the White House right now talked about building a wall, and then they started separating families from their children, right? So the children were, were left here in America, and the families were sent back or deported back to where they came from. I mean, when you think about that, that's a, a, a former portion of slavery, because children were separated from their parents, just sold away from their parents. In yeah. this case, if, if, if the United States does come to its senses, these children will be reunited with their parents. But think about the trauma they will have experienced to be separated yeah. from their parents and with these people with guns and things walking around them. You know, I mean, that, that's, that's a massive trauma that these kids yeah. are going to experience. So 
That's all I had to say about that. So let's talk about, you, you have something to add? you want to add, please? Well, no, I mean, you touched upon a topic. I actually, it's very near and dear to me just because, you know, obviously my parents are immigrants. I mean, I grew up in a community of immigrants. I was one of the only handful of people that are actually born in the U.S. that I knew when I was growing up. Almost all of my friends are from another country. And so just the rhetoric when it comes to immigrants that has happened transpired i mean and it's and it's not you know to be fair it's not it didn't just begin with the current occupant in the white house you know it's been like this for years but the rhetoric against immigrants i just i cannot abide by it it makes me so angry and sad because especially since i mean we as a country fail to fix our broken immigration system I mean, I can't even begin, I mean, I, mean, I won't, I mean, this, this is not the topic of our conversation, but to go into how different our immigration system is now and has been for a while, as opposed to like, for example, when my parents came in, there is absolutely no way in God's green earth that my parents could come into the U.S. now. Like if it was like them trying to come now. Right. And I think about that too, like every day, yeah. about the missed opportunities for people who are not able to come in because of our broken immigration system. And, you know, my parents didn't come from a lot. They didn't have a lot of education. They came here to work. My mom came here at 15 and worked. Mm -hmm. um, and they had children and their children now one of them works for duke another one is a is a ux ui engineer another one works in the federal government and went to johns hopkins you know like i you know they are the american story and you know we're barring that from so many people now because of our broken immigration system there's just no way legally right now for people to come in that are just like my parents and we've always that was always our immigration system and we've just effectively like cut that off and like it's just I don't know it's it's horrible I, I think it goes back to that slogan of make America great you know if you translate it into plain English it means make America white because of the number of black and brown people that are in the United States that they're talking about probably in the next 20 or 30 years there will be no majority probably be equal uh, parts white, equal parts brown and black, you know, and I think that's a part of it. But I do think that, you know, what's really ironic and hypocritical about that is so when you talk about Ellis Island, people came from every part of Europe into America through that, looking for a better life. And so now you've got these Mexican people who were in America b before the colonists came, you know, they, they did what they did. I mean, they may not, may not have come, like say the Montana or North Dakota, but they were in parts of, of Texas and in other parts of the world. They came, they worked, most of them went back home because they were, go, you know, supporting their families back in Mexico or Philippines or wherever they were. They weren't not, you know, here to stay, right? They just came and came and went, right? So they just, just mm -hmm. did so. But white people immigrated into the United States, accepted, you know, you know, I, I don't know if you, you, you are a history buff, but if you look at the history of Italians, especially Sicilian Italians, they were darker skinned, you know, so not white, like, you know, white people, they were darker skinned. They were discriminated and treated as they were black. And so, you know, all of these things that we have done as a country go straight to your point, right? Because we have done all we could to make sure that black and brown people stayed in the economic and the muted status that they have been in forever. So you have these little spots where what you were talking about, your, your sisters and brothers and them, their career, they're little speckles. You know, they're not like that's a whole wedge. If you could take a, a, you know, a cookie or a cheese and say, you know, like Don Hopkins has all, all, all of their families are students like you or like your sisters and brothers. You know, they're little sprinkles. And so every time it seems like that there's a community that advance they have to advance on the conditions and terms that white people allow. And mm -hmm. it's simply that, and that's unfortunate. And for me, those children and those immigration camps or whatever they're called these days is the most heartbreaking thing that I can think of that we have done since slavery, 
Jim Crow. It's just absolutely horrific that we would do something like that to children because of a broken immigration policy. And no one is willing to tackle that. No president has fully tackled it. Now, Obama did DACA, you know, which is really great, but that, that was just a little slice. You know, it was just a little slice. It wasn't like the whole hunk of cheese. So, yeah. Right on, right on. I mean, you make a yeah. beautiful point. You a beautiful point that you make. So thank you for that. So, yeah. so you are you work in graduate education, undergraduate, yeah, undergraduate, yeah, undergraduate education. And what does that mean in plain English? What do you do? So yeah, so I work in the global education office for undergraduates. So basically, I manage a portfolio of Duke's overseas uh, study abroad opportunities, basically. Uh, we also have domestic opportunities, but the bulk of my portfolio is our overseas opportunities. So basically, I run a regional team. You know, I have a portfolio within a, a geographical regions and uh, the sites that Duke owns, for example, like, for example, we have a big site in Madrid. Um, I oversee that. I'm the program manager for that. So we have staff there. We send you know, for example, in the fall, 55 student, Duke students to study there. And I just manage all aspects of running that program. Um, and, you know, other programs at Mark Portfolio, uh, we have a program site in Venice, um, run summer programs, faculty led, uh, and work with the faculty on, on creating, implementing, implementing, sorry, and uh, evaluating all those programs. And is this your dream job or what's next? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I love what I do. Um, I don't know what's next. <laughs> I'm just contemplating that now. But, you know, international education, I felt really strongly about it. And a lot of it has to do uh, with questions about diversity and inclusion. Because, you know, when I was growing up, I, for example, I, it, was in history class and I was reading about France and England and Spain and all these things and I was like you know I really would like to go visit there mm -hmm. I want to see this you know this is all this history that I hear and of course obviously it was more from a Eurocentric you know um, point of view all of this stuff since then I've just you know kind of laid that a little bit to the side but um, and but you know I never had money to to my, like my when we traveled we went back to my parents home places in Trinidad and Dominican Republic so um when I was in college I got the opportunity I um, was awarded a National Science Foundation um, I don't know scholarship or something like that to for a fully funded opportunity in Hungary for a, an archaeological dig and so that was the first time I ever traveled uh, to Europe, and I was just, you know, over the moon. I was so happy. This was such a, you know, uh, a thing that I wanted to accomplish. And I learned a lot on that program. And, but one of the things I learned was just, again, <laughs> questions about my identity, because here I am, again, one of the only, I mean, the only non white person. <laughs> in the group and it was a group of Americans but we were in this small village in Hungary and I just felt like the hugest outsider mm -hmm. I did not feel very welcomed in my group mm -hmm. you know I I mean with some exceptions I mean but I just really it was it was very tough for me I mean I love my program I love what I learn you know, the experience, I'll never take it back, but it was just very tough being the only not. And then I, I actually felt more affinity and like felt more inclusion and, and just niceties from the Hungarians. And I didn't even speak Hungarian. I didn't know anything about Hungary. And that was a really big, um, you know, just mind shock to me. I just, I, here we, I am with my fellow Americans and I just, I, it was not, not a good experience. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, 
I went into international education because I wanted to make sure that other people like me had these types of opportunities. Because if you look at the numbers for um, US college students studying abroad, it's predominantly white females. Um, you know, I have a, a, you know, inclination or like a, a feeling that, you know, a lot of the models for traditional study abroad were catered to or built for, you know, liberal arts educated white females. Um, and, you know, especially in this today's day and age, which was, we're such a global society and we're working in teams that are globally minded. We have people from all over the place talking to each other. I really do feel like having a global education or global experiences is really important. So I want to make sure that, again, other people who traditionally have not uh, done these types of programs do and to encourage them to do so. And I, you know, so opening those opportunities up has been a, a focus of mine in my work. And I've had the fort like the fortunate or the fortune to work with a lot of minority students when it comes to studying abroad. And it's been really eye-opening for me. So for example, I've worked with students who are Black, uh, Amer African-American Black students who have gone abroad and who have told me very similar things that when they're in their cohort of American students, that they just don't feel welcome or they don't feel like they're within their own community. Because so for example, I know Black students at Duke you know, they have the Mary Lou Williams Center for Black Culture. They have their, you know, they have their support groups, you know, their their social circles that they rely on. You know, they go to class, but then they form their own, you know, again, supports within Duke amongst your friends. People are like-minded, but when you're doing a program like a, a study abroad program, you're, thro you're with a whole bunch of different people that, you know, is not part of your normal support network and again, it, it starts to get kind of like, hmm. And so I, you know, it, for them, it was a very big learning experience. And a lot of it had to do with that aspect of it is learning about themselves and their own culture by going somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And then also I've worked with black students who've gone and studied abroad for example to countries in Africa so I've had students who've gone to Ghana and in one sense it, it's such a it's it's so interesting because a lot of the students they went there to as to seek their cultural heritage for example um or if you know or just see how because a lot of um slave ships came from let's say like that coast there and like Ghana and everything and they just kind of wanted to see you know for example how, uh, people who lived there and and how the, all of the slave trade just went from the perspective of you know countries in that area and they went there thinking like okay well I'm black now I'm gonna feel like I'm gonna be in a majority black place I'm I'm gonna feel you know like part of the, the crowd and like all this stuff. And it was not the case, not at all. Um, they saw them as Americans first, yep. even though they were black. I mean, it, it w and, and to some of the students, I felt so bad because they were looking for that sense of inclusion, like finally, you know, to, to be in a, a place where it's like, I'm, it's a majority black and, and they didn't find it. And it was very, you know, hard for them in one sense. Um, and then also just, just seeing the differences between, you know, how black people in, in African countries live and just black people in, uh, you know, the US live and just the, you know, one sense like feeling that they were cheated in the sense that like, there's all this rich culture here and they don't know their cultural heritage from that place so long ago because it's been so long ago and and you know it was taken from them but then you know they have their culture here in the u.s and so it, it's it's really interesting to see those those experience see those the students experience those things and and the transformations and like just the 
everything that goes on with with that. That was beautiful to hear. I, I want to come back to a couple of things you said. First, I want to start with Africa. So Africans consider themselves better than African Americans. That's one of the reasons why I walked away from that term, because Africa considers itself pure. And we are unpure because we have been violated in all the ways that we have been violated as a people in America. So Africans don't, and I mean, all you have to do is go to DC. You don't even have to go all the way to Africa, just go to DC as a huge African community and see the way they see black and brown people compared to themselves. They are superior to us. So if you think about that, just in a small little capsule, right? White people are superior to us and African people are superior to us. So we sit right here in this middle little spot where there is no safe space. And there was a woman who wrote a book, it's old now, I think it's at least 10, 15 years old. It's just, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? I don't know if you read it or not, but it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. Mm -hmm. And it talks about what you just said, you know. And so a lot of times when you hear affinity groups talk about going to a predominantly white school or going, you know, whether it's high school, middle school, college, wherever it is, they don't belong. And so, you know, in the in the DNI space, D and D E and I space lately, they've added a B to it. So belonging, right? So we haven't mastered the first three letters, and now we've added another one on there, belonging, right? So diversity, equity, and inclusion, belonging. So people have been concentrating on belonging. But if you have no home, so I can't go, I can go, I can send my DA, DNA to ancestry.com, but they can't tell me where I am. Who, who are my Pam great, great grandparents in America? So how am I going to trace my roots back to Ghana? So yes, you, you'll, full, you'll find that I have whatever that bloodline is, wherever I came from there but who am i you know so can i go to ghana and search out and find my grandparents my great 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 grandparents or the people who who whose tribe i belong to before they were sold away to the to the americans or the colonists or whoever they were uh, i can't go there but but i think the point that you made was just really something that i think i would like to ask you to do so you know what your experience was when you went to hungary and went abroad and how you how can you fix that for these kids to prepare them for that feeling of non-belonging? So my daughter went to um, Finland. She was going to be a doctor. She was starting to be a doctor. And so she had done this program and she was working through Chapel Hill. And so she had gone to Finland and she had gone with a group of, you know, very diverse groups and black, brown, white, all kinds of kids had gone, gone on this trip. And they were in Finland for like six months, I think, or something like that. I don't know exactly. I don't know all the details. It's been a very, very long time ago, but she went and uh, she too, had the exact same story that you just shared, you know, right? So in her little clique of black friends, you know, so when they went out of Finland, they went to other countries, you know, they went together as opposed to the whole cohort that had gone to Finland together, you know? So how are you or how will you or how can you prepare these black and brown children for those experiences that they will have when they leave the United States and they're with their cohorts, and then they're going into another place where they may or may not be accepted. Loretta Brightwell. Brightwell. Yeah, so that's a that's an interesting question, and when I find the answer, I'll I'll share it with you, because it's something that you know within my field, um, me and other minds have been at it for a long time. Now, preparation. I mean, we have a lot of prep preparatory materials. I mean, we have stuff out there for students to read um, to, that talks exactly about these types of things. But it's one thing for them to read about it and to and for us even to give them a heads up that this might happen. And another thing for them to actually, when they go over there and actually experience it and how to move beyond, like to, I, w I won't say move beyond it because you can't really move beyond it, uh, but just to just thrive or, or to, to have your experience and, and for it not to be something detrimental to their experience. Um, and it's, it's difficult. I mean, like it's complicated and difficult. Um, it's something that, you know, so, you know, there's, there's a certain type, there's a couple of certain, couple of types of students that go abroad, the ones that prepare you know, and they're like, okay, I want to know about this and this. I love that type of student. I talk to them about all these things, you know, like just make sure about these types of things. You, you, you may or may not experience it, but let's be prepared. Mm -hmm. And then the other student who 
doesn't want to prepare at all. They just want to go in. It's an adventure. There's a, plot me over there, right? And, you know, I feel like either way, the outcome is somewhat similar, even if I prepare them versus not, because it's something that they have to go through in a certain sense. But the one thing that I feel that strongly that we can do is the people that are part of the program, so the ones that are leading it, for them to be trained in order to help guide the student through it. Because, yeah, because they are the ones, I mean, like, you know, faculty, mentors, program staff, all those people that are supposed to be there to help the students. Mm -hmm. It's, I feel strongly that with these types of programs, it's not just, okay, I'm teaching you academics or, you know, whatever is the program's purpose, but they have to also be there for the student to help guide them through those cultural shifts, those, you know, um, the culture shock and the um, adjustment period and, and all these things that come with not being in your home country for a, a given time. Yeah. So, yeah. That's absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much for that. We have about three minutes, so I'm going to leave the remaining time to you. Say whatever you wish to say that we didn't cover or. Yeah, no, I think we covered a lot. I mean, I thank you for, um, contacting me to to talk about these things it's really refreshing I mean I don't get the opportunity very often to talk about these types of issues mm -hmm. so thank you um you know just in general when it comes to just my little piece of the world and and thinking about you know race and diversity inclusion equity all that stuff um it you know, we're at a, a point in our country where I feel that we need to change. Like, we need to change so dramatically. Much. Yeah. And, you know, from my part of the, uh, the world, as far as being a person who's first generation, whose parents not from here, who's half Hispanic and half Caribbean, you know, I, I see what our country is going through and I just think, you know, we just need to change. Um, and people need to be nicer to each other, honestly, and be open to, to one another. I mean, everybody has differences. You know, I, I feel like I'm a type of person, you know, um, when I go into spaces that are not my own, you know, um, I'm always going into uh I mentioned that I'm often the only non-white person in some spaces that I occupy. I mean, I, I try to get to know people and I try to find the common ground and, and to, you know, work with them. I mean, there's so many people that mispronounce my name, for example, or, you know, say very just really odd things about like, where are you from? And like, you know, what about your hair? Like all this stuff. And, you know, at first I try not to be very um, offended but I try to find that common ground and try to work with them because, you know, I, I do feel like for the most part, most people are good. Yeah. And it's just misunderstanding that really gets us um, into trouble. So I don't know. I, I have high hopes. I, I hope that things change and I hope that, you know, we can come together and um, you know, I, you know, for my daughter's sake, I, I, I do feel that, Things are changing, but it's it's usually slow. So very, exceptionally slow. Thank you very much for doing this with me. Um, brilliant woman. Great to talk with you. Thank and, you. Uh, I look forward to our next talk. And as soon as this video converts, I'll send you a link so you can listen to it and see if there's anything we need to do differently. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Bye. Okay, bye.